without an economics department. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm actually quite pleased to do this debate. Uh, I think some very fundamental issues have been raised, and, uh, and uh, not least because since we are roughly of the same generation, I'm slightly older, uh, I went up to the same university in 1965, I won't mention the university. These are very, very familiar discussions because that was it's probably the heyday of student uh, radicalism, Marxism, the dominant strand of thinking at that time uh, about the, the soon to come end of capitalism. And uh, uh, probably uh, both of us have ended up many decades later, roughly, where we started. If you uh, read my column, you know that I always start with some questions. So I'm going to lay out my questions, which I want to deal to, which I want to discuss. They relate, in some ways, quite closely to what's been said, but in others, not. It's inevitable, because, uh, uh, because we, are, we are both starting to lay out our own views of, of what's going on. Uh, but I will try, since I, I exploited the opportunity of going second, to address some of Alex's points in the last few minutes, if I have time. So the questions I want to, to deal with are, first, have we been here before? Second, what actually happened in getting to this mess? Are we on third, are we on our way out of it? In other words, how big a crisis is it? Fourth, is it possible to ensure that such a crisis will not recur? And finally, does the crisis mean the end of capitalism? And you won't be surprised by my view, is that many have predicted the end of capitalism many times, and they have always been wrong. Um, okay, have we been here before? I'd like to start with a quotation, which I think is very relevant to where we are now. Um, it's from John Maynard Keynes in his uh, uh, Essays in Persuasion, which he referred to what had happened to the economy in the early 1930s, as we have magneto, or alternator, trouble. In other words, what he was saying is, we have this huge economic engine, it's clearly got some absolutely serious me mechanical fault, but what we've got to do is find out what this fault is and fix it. And Keynes, if you like, was the ultimate anti-Marxist, I would say, rather successfully so, in what he implemented, in that his approach was the aim of what I want to do is to get through the system through this problem, which is a very, very severe one, dramatically more severe than we're now experiencing, and then get it going again, as I believe it can and should. If we were having the debate in 1936, for example, which is the year of the publication of his general theory of the interest in money, virtually all of us would have concluded, even more, I suspect, than you already have, that capitalism was finished. Indeed, many people, particularly educated people, in fact, virtually all educated people, concluded just that at the time. The only economies that appeared immune to the global crisis were the Soviet Union and Hitler's Third Reich. And so the socialist idea of state central planning seemed utterly triumphant. The world economy was in total ruins and in its traditional capitalist guise, Protection against imports was almost universal, and employment had reached a staggering quarter of the labor force in many countries, most notably in the United States at its peak. A wave of banking crises and public sector defaults had cracked across the world economy. About uh, a half of all American banks, if I remember correctly, disappeared. Prices had fallen sharply, there was a massive deflation. And of course, governments were intervening radically in ways never before, seen before. So, any sensible person would conclude, I would suggest even more so than today, that liberal capitalism was as dead as a doorway. It was finished. And yet, this conclusion turned out, I'm sure you could at least agree with that, looking at where we are now, to be rather seriously mistaken. And the question is, of course, why? why, therefore, I believe the same will happen again. Because capitalism adapted. It is simply the most adaptable system imaginable. Because at heart, it's simply a system of decentralization, political and economic, with the flexibility associated with that. And as it turned out to be the case, and I agree, you can easily argue that 
uh, the Stalinist example wasn't relevant. It wasn't what we really meant. Nonetheless, it radically failed to adapt the concentration of power and information in the system for an extreme rigidity and the Soviet system, which I can remember very well in, my in the 50s and 60s, I'm old enough to remember this, was widely believed, widely believed to be vastly superior to the Western model, um, actually failed. And Keynes, I would argue, remains relevant to our discussion today because he also explained how we need to adapt. It was necessary to manage an aggregate demand above all, and rather than assume, simply assume it would always be at full employment levels. We had to deal with specific, well-identified problems in the economic system, and then the market economy's competitive and decentralized system could proceed. So the way I approach this crisis, very differently obviously from Alex, is in that spirit. I do believe in the qualities of liberal and democratic capitalism. I believe it is the best way for running societies and complicate complex modern economies, I'll come to that later. And I believe it's the least bad system available because it uses available decentralized knowledge in the competitive system, vastly more effective than this incredibly complicated system of voting that he outlines. And it actually makes human imperfections, because we are imperfect, productive. It is not perfect, far from it. Nothing human, human is. This is an explicitly non-utopian position. I am very strongly of the persuasion we've had enough utopianism in our lifetimes of that kind. When it fails, as it clearly has, I have no disagreement of that in the specific respect of the financial crisis, we have to learn from that failure, as Keynes argued, and apply what Karl Popper, another important philosopher of the middle of the 20th century, called, I quote, piecemeal social engineering, end of quote. In other words, responses to specific problems. And indeed, we have already learned from the 1930s, which is why we have not repeated the depression that experienced then. And what we are probably going to have at the end of this is a decline of GDP in the world as a whole of perhaps 2 or 3%, which means GDP at the worst of this depression will be roughly the same in the world as a whole as it was in 2007. That's obviously a considerable shock, but it does seem to me that some of the description that has been given here is how, how does one put it, hugely exaggerated. How did we get into the mess? This is the second question. Well, I would argue is that we have seen a classic developing country financial crisis, and I've written a lot about those in this book, but this time at the core of the world economy. Financial crises are indeed, as Hyman Rinsky argued, a classic feature of a decentralized market economic system and of the financial system associated with it. What drives such a crisis? Well, he argued, and I think persuasively, first, the perception of a new opportunity a new opportunity for lending to people who had previously not been able to borrow, subprime borrowers in particular, new lenders, an asset price bubble, very frequent event in, in world economic history, a lending spree, this time by the world's biggest bank, a bursting of the asset price bubble, and a sudden stop or market panic. <coughs> it's obviously important to understand why this particular Minsky cycle occurred if we want to devise systems which will radically reduce the likelihood of its being repeated, uh, um, events of this scale are very rare, of course, but which will radically reduce the likelihood of its being repeated. First, classic euphoria, uh, uh, undue belief among decision makers across the world in the idea of the great moderation, basically that the business cycle of extraordinary uh, euphoria. I've written quite a bit about this. Secondly, it's interesting that Alex hasn't discussed, it, discussed this, but we are living through a, a period of extraordinary structural upheaval in the world economy with the emergence of new powers, particularly in Asia, and associated with that, quite astonishing financial developments, the emergence of the global imbalances and quite extraordinary reserve accumulations in the late 1990s and early 2000s, 
And this had many results, of which the most important by far were a period of exceptionally low real and nominal interest rates, and with that, among many investors, the search for yield. In the context of this world environment, which seems so benign, and the undue belief in the great moderation, the decision was made by central banks to pursue a highly accommodative monetary policy aimed purely at targeting inflation. Indeed, that was what they had been asked to do. Against this background, a period, Minsky describes this as a classic financial innovation to provide notionally safe, high yielding assets. And then, as is always the case, or is frequently the case, regulators and governments made standard failures of commission and emission. The commission imposing uh, what turned out to be utterly mistaken risk weighted capital ratios, reliance on ratings and emission, deregulation of securities and housing markets to an undue extent. So, is this particular crisis fundamentally different from previous ones, particularly the previous post war ones? Yes, I would argue it is in three fundamental ways, and that's what's made it so serious. This time it's affected economies directly, which account for about half of the world economy. Second, the patterns of lending were more complicated than any normal financial crisis, made it much more difficult to handle. And third, and most important, of course, the IMF cannot boil bail out the US, but fortunately the US has so far at least been able to bail out itself. Third question, are we on our way out of the mess? I would argue yes, but only up to a point. First, the yes part. In response to the meltdown, we have seen, because they had red canes, the most spectacular response of governments ever in peacetime, an explosion of fiscal deficits to an average in the advanced countries of 9% of GDP in 2009, up from 1% in 2007, short-term interest rates at zero, socialization of the liabilities of systemically, systemic, systemically significant institutions. So we have seen, without a doubt, the most Keynesian policy there's ever been. Indeed, the policy he would have recommended if he'd been alive, and he did recommend it the third time. And as the G10 T, I think, rightly declared, it worked. It worked in the simple sense that the down period lasted two, two quarters, as far as we can see. In most economies, not here, the economies have stabilized, credit markets have recovered dramatically, and the massive collapses in manufacturing world trade are actually in the process of being reversing, or being reversed. GDP forecasts are consistently being upgraded now. I think you might be very surprised by how strong the world recovery is next year. But I, since I'm going to be as honest as I can about this, I don't think that's the end of this story. We clearly have some substantial uh, challenges to overcome, in particular the deleveraging of over-indebted households in the US, UK, and a few other highly indebted advanced countries. Private consumption is, of course, weak in much of the world because savings are rising. The necessary rebalancing of global demand from the previously high deficit countries to the surplus countries, which is an inescapable part of right getting out of this recession, has only just begun. And of course, we have this massive ongoing leveraging of governments. Essentially, what has happened, and I think absolutely right and correctly in this massive recession, is to governments have continued basically to spend as if nothing had happened, their revenues have collapsed. So in this country, the government is spending roughly four pounds for every three pounds in tax it receives. And all I was saying in those columns is that something is going to give. Of course, it is perfectly open to somebody to suggest that tax ratios should rise by a third. That's a perfectly reasonable argument if you want to make it. I suspect that's not what's going to serve in politics. And therefore, some of the ultimate adjustment to what will turn out to be the structural fiscal deficit some of this is clearly structural, will require spending reductions, or at least reductions in the growth of spending. So what we've been told is that, learned yet again, is that financial crises are indeed very costly, as we know, but what we also, I think, learned, I think we are learning, and I think we will see very strongly over the next year or two, is that the fundamental remedies discussed for these sorts of crises in the 30s and thereafter 
in dealing with the sort of panic and breakdown actually work. And I think Alex is going to be deeply disappointed. I think once again, the death of capitalism will turn out, as Mark Twain might have said, to have been a, a, a great, the rumor of the death of capitalism to be greatly exaggerated. My fourth question, can we even ensure it will never happen again? And the honest answer to that is no, we cannot ensure that it will never happen again. A, uh, a complex market system, a system of coordinating the supply and demand of products over time and space, above all over time, of the scale and complexity of the current world economy, including billions of people and billions of products, is not one which will not occasionally be subject to breakdown. And I, my, I, I would argue very strongly that that would apply to any imaginable system. We can discuss that later on if we get time to, to, time, time to that. And the financial system particularly, because it embodies the hopes, aspirations of many people, including those who decide to buy a house, uh, hoping that it will go up in price and then suddenly discover it doesn't, and all the rest of it, that these hopes and fears will turn out frequently to be mistaken, and therefore the financial system is fragile and will from time to, to time break down. It's particularly true in the context of the euphoria that I mentioned, that the fact that we have not had such a crisis in the core countries of the developed world for, for about 80 years, which is really quite a long time, made it to most participants in financial markets and in policy making essentially an inconceivable event, something that seemed very unlikely, and in my view, the very fact that they thought it was unlikely made it very much more attractive for them to take the sort of behavior that actually made it likely. This is a classic Hyman Minsky point, and Hyman Minsky, of course, was the most significant Keynesian discussing the financial markets in the second half of the 20th century. We cannot easily uh, control the financial system because of its fundamental characteristics at the heart of, our, of any decentralized market economy. But it's pretty clear what the sorts of things are that we will have to do radically to diminish the chances of a repeat of this crisis. In particular, I would argue, we will have to be willing, and I've argued this in my columns, to use monetary policy much more aggressively in response to asset price bubbles. Leaning against the wind makes much more sense than simply assuming that asset prices are self-equilibrating. We're clearly going to have to tighten regulation of core financial institutions significantly. Those we judge too big to fail by higher capital requirements across the board, with a particularly strong bias against very big, too big to fail institutions. And this will also, I believe, desirably, it's happened before, shrink the size of the financial system. We will have to introduce an effective resolution regime for all financial institutions. We will have to change uh, the whole way we structure the provisioning in financial institutions. We will have to fix the whole trading structure for financial products by moving them on to exchange, and we will have to separate domestic core finance from the global financial system, and finally, we will have to take on excessive fiscal privileges for debt. And of course, these are all things I'm sure that bore most of you completely, but in my very strong view, when you deal with this very complicated system, as I said before, what I think is the right approach is to, to, is to do just precisely this sort of piecemeal social engineering, which is designed to address the specific sources of this particular problem. And then, finally, the big thing, is this the end of, cap, uh, of capitalism? And my answer to that is, we are not, in fact, going to replace capitalism. And I'll, I'll come in a second, because it simply has been, and I'm sorry about this, I, in fact, almost weep for you, but it has been the most productive and successful economic system there has ever been. It is so because it relies upon and coordinates, as I said, the decentralized initiative of hundreds of millions or billions of people. 
And uh, we may want to give it up. In fact, it's pretty clear we do want to give it up. But I think there's the slightest chance you're going to persuade China or India to abandon their experiment with the market economic system, admittedly, of course, in different ways, control, uh, uh, control experiments. Because from their point of view, this period, uh, this period, um, this period has been one of simply staggering and unbelievable success. In the liberalization process, China's GDP per head has increased since 1980 tenfold, and India's has increased fourfold. This is not something they're going to give up for some entirely dreamlike alternative, uh, alternative uh, system. So the question, I think, is really not whether we're going to have capitalism, because we're certainly going to have it, but precisely what sort of capitalism we're going to have. How far is it going to be national or global? In other words, how far are we going to move back to the sorts of highly autarkic protectionism capitalism that actually existed at the beginning of the post-war period rather than the more global capitalism today. How far, how exactly are we going to strike the balance between the free market or regulation? It's obviously going to be much more regulated than it was a few years ago. The question is how much more. The third question, will there be one model of capitalism or many very different ones? And the answer I think is pretty clear. The idea of a hegemonic model, the one simple model is probably over, and we're going to have many, many uh, very different uh, ones. So we're going to clearly need a great deal of global reform, and we're going to clearly need a great deal of institutional change to make this system work better, just the sort of reform process we've been engaged in before. But let me just make the simple conclusion. We are not going to end. Uh, end to capitalism because we will find that by the sorts of methods that I have suggested it will again prove horrifyingly or wonderfully adaptable it will go on and people who have come to enter into the market economic system around the world and have as a result experienced enormous increases in living standards will continue to insist upon and demand insist upon that and demand that and I think given the time that I have already taken, perhaps we sh to be fair, we can debate each other on these specific points that Alex made later. But the fundamental point I wanted to make is very simple. Capitalism fails. Capitalism always survives. Bet on capitalism.